Good morning, parents and students. May I first wish all of you a good year ahead and good results for the O-Levels. This morning, I'm here to answer three questions so that you get a sense of what you need to do and how you think through the choices you make for JC education. The first question is, why go to a junior college? After your O-Levels, you will have opportunities to go for different pathways to a junior college, to the polytechnic, or to some other institution. Junior college was started, or the first junior college, National Junior College, which is us, was started in 1969 for a reason, to bring together students, to study together so that when they complete their two years, they will go to university. Before National Junior College started, all schools, many schools in Singapore have what we call pre-university classes. I was one of the many students then in the 1970s uh, in a pre-university class. Think about it. Pre-university, what does that mean? It means preparing you for university. So to come to a two-year junior college now, and we have many junior colleges in Singapore now, is actually to prepare yourselves to go to the university. Of course, whether you eventually go to the university or not really depends on uh, many other factors, how you perform at the A-levels, what your thoughts are regarding university education, or again, to go somewhere else to pursue a different pathway. So the first point, coming to a two-year junior college means that you are preparing yourself to go to the university. And therefore, within the two years, it is an intense period. It is a period whereby you grow very fast, you have to learn very fast, and you have to be prepared for what we call final examination after the end of two years. I go back to what I've said earlier regarding pre-university when I was a student. Then many of us completed the two years pre-university and many actually did not go to the university because then the university participation rate was not high. Go to university. Now, the participation rate is very, very high, more than 30 or 40 percent. In fact, almost every one of you who will eventually go to uh, JC will ultimately uh, pursue university education. And therefore, uh, we must prepare you to be able to go to university and be ready to learn quickly because after pre-university or JC, uh, you are much on your own in terms of learning and how you would proceed to help yourself learn. Because university, as far as I'm concerned, uh, will not in some way uh, be so close to you while you are in a JC. So first, coming to JC means your aim is to proceed to the university whichever university. Number two, how do you choose junior college? I will be very upfront about this. Every junior college, the aim is to prepare you as well as possible to go to the university. Of course, in Singapore, students choose the JC you want to go to depending on a few factors. Number one, undeniably, is your O-level scores. Number two is how you feel about a particular junior college. There are always misconceptions, perspectives that make you decide which JC you would like to go to. I have gone on uh, different forums and read students' reflections about uh, particular junior colleges. Some of the reflections are, I would say, um, reflective of how they feel and think. It might not be a true uh, interpretation, as far as I'm concerned, about life in the particular junior college. So, 
how do you choose? Of course, as I said earlier, number one, it is your O-level points. Number two, it is your perspective and how you think and feel based on what you have read, based on what your friends have said to you, based on what your parents have said to you, based on what you have discussed with different groups of people. So this is how do you choose? Number three, why do you want to choose National Junior College? And this is, to me, the most important question at this point in time because I'm talking to you about National Junior College. National Junior College was the first college to be set up in Singapore, as I said earlier, for a particular reason, to putting together um, students from different schools to study and be prepared for university. Since then, many other junior colleges have been set up. And now we have a system whereby we have both junior colleges as well as uh, schools that offer the IB, the junior colleges offer A-levels. Why NJC? Number one, in NJC, we focus on innovation in learning. What does that mean? Over the last few years, we have been looking at how learning can take place and how learning can be made better for students. From next year onwards, sorry, from this year onwards, and I get my years wrong, since we are only at the beginning of the year, all our junior college students will be in classes where seminar style lessons are conducted. In the very recent past, uh, lectures, tutorials were still the main mode of delivery. We have transited since last year to a seminar style system. Why? Because we know the seminar style system is actually more suited for teaching and learning, more suited for students to learn better. This is where you can ask questions, you can challenge one another, you can learn from your peers. And this is important because learning is about not just learning from your teachers. It's also about learning from your peers. It's also about learning to ask questions. And seminar style classes provide you the opportunity. So you will see from uh, the videos later that how, um, how seminar style lessons are conducted in NJC. And this is something that is unique perhaps to NJC because we have transited very quickly. Number two, we leverage uh, technology very much. You will hear from my colleagues too, how we leverage technology for learning, how we want you to become autonomous learners, meaning very self-directed, self-motivated. And that is also important because preparing for the A-level examinations and in future preparing for university education requires you to be self-motivated and autonomous. The next reason is relationships. In National Junior College, it is critical and very, very upfront that relationships between students and students, teachers and teachers is a critical factor. Relationships is critical because Good relationships between teachers and students, between students and students, will help you to learn better. I have always said to National Junior College students, when you come to National Junior College, work together as a team, work together as a class, work together with your teachers, and you do well. Warm relationships between teachers and students is a critical factor for success in your learning. And we emphasize this a lot. I've spoken to my colleagues many times regarding how we should work together with students, encourage them, help them to learn, make them good learners. So these are three reasons why you should consider National Junior College as a college of choice. For all of us here, we focus very much on student-teacher relationships, on how learning can be done and what we need to do in order to help you improve. So when you think about how you want to make your choice, consider what I've just said, 
think through why you want to go to a particular junior college. Why is it something you want to consider? Or NJC, some, a, a junior college you want to consider. My last point is that we have an integrated program for the first four years and the students from the integrated program will join you. We mix all of you together. Our beliefs are that students who come from different secondary schools and students from our IP program must exchange their views, must exchange their knowledge because it is always critical for us to know what one another is doing, how we learn, share our experiences, and come together as a team, as a group, to work together, to learn together. So in National Junior College, we don't separate the JAE students like yourselves with from the IP students. We want you to mix, we want you to share your experiences, we want you to come together. This is, to me, a very important reason why we want you to come to National Junior College, to share your views, to share your experiences. So thank you very much for listening to me. I have asked three questions, as I said earlier, and tried to answer them. Number one, why receive a junior, junior college education? How do you choose a junior college? And what are the reasons that you might want to consider National Junior College as a college of choice for you? Thank you very much and have a good day.
Good morning, parents. Good morning, students. Um, this is the Q&A session. Uh, please keep your comments coming through or your questions coming through the comment section of uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook live stream. Before we begin, let me introduce the panel that's joining us this morning. Uh, with me are my colleagues, um, Ms. Tan Josie, who is the HOD for PE and CCA, Ms. Michelle Ng, who is the HOD for Aesthetics. She looks after the art program and the music program at NJC as well. Uh, Ms. Lim Wei Li, who is HOD for Research. Mr. Tio Zewei, who is HOD for ICT and for Academic Administration. And of course, um, Mr. Ang, you have already met uh, earlier this morning if you have joined the session earlier. Uh, my name is Mr. Joel. I am the Vice Principal of National Junior College. Okay. Uh, we'll take the questions as they come in. Sometimes the questions overlap with one another and we'll try to aggregate them and give you a collected response. Right. Um, first, we have a question about subject combination and what you can do with that subject combination upon graduation uh, or after taking the A-levels. Um, may I invite Mr. Teo, who is uh, HOD for Academic Administration, to take this question. Mr. Teo, please. Hi, uh, morning, everyone. Uh, so, uh, uh, if you can see from the screen now, okay, you, you, I'm just giving you an example of what we can possibly see in our, our college website. Uh, in National Junior College, we have both. Sorry. Uh, good morning, everyone. So sorry, I was uh, muted. Uh, I didn't unmute myself uh, just now. Allow me to repeat all, all over again. Now, you can look at the screen now. Uh, this screen is captured from the uh, National Junior College website, Subject Combinations. Okay, in National Junior College, we offer a total of six art stream combinations and a total of eight science stream combinations. So I'm illustrating you an example. Okay, so uh, but in each combination, there are many, many possible subjects you can, uh, you can be offered and you can take. So say, for example, if you were to look at the science 8 combination, no, wrong, uh, maybe say the science 7 combination, it will be uh, physics. The first subject will be physics or biology. Second subject will be chemistry. Third subject will be mathematics. And fourth subject will be econ e economics, all at H2 level. So uh, it seems that there, are, there could be a total of only 14 uh, combinations of National Junior College. But in each combination, there can be many, many uh, permutations and, uh, and combinations of subjects that can be offered. Now, uh, to help you answer a while of the uh, so-called the causes that will be uh, useful for university, what you will probably need to do is to refer to the various local autonomous universities website to look for the specific cause and what will be the required uh, A-level uh, subjects and uh, maybe the grades required for entrance to the specific course in that university. Yeah, uh, I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Teo. Um, the next question, I, I'll, I'll take the next question. It's about um, the number of students that NJC takes in under the JE. Uh, in total, in school, we have about 1,800, 1,900 students. Okay? Uh, this is, of course, limited by a physical setting as well. Um, we have about 200 students per level at the IP. At JC1, we take in about 300 students. Uh, for the JE. This number has, of course, uh, reduced across all colleges over the years uh, because of the uh, drop in enrollment in the student population. Um, so you can see the percentage sort of, it's almost one is to one uh, or two is to three. The next question is on seminar style teaching, right? And uh, does that mean, so the, the, the person who has asked this question asked if, uh, if this implies that no more tutorial classes. The idea of a seminar is to ensure that the student participates actively in the learning process. A lecture, if you think about it, um, there's a lot more work on the part of the person presenting. Uh, when it comes to tutorial, of course, it's, it's all the way across on the other end where the student is doing a whole bunch of things. But if you think about a seminar, it's to allow a student to think through participate, ask questions, get involved, work with peers, and also to reflect on thinking a little bit more than what you would have perhaps in a lecture and or tutorial setting. So the seminar sort of sits in between. 
Uh, does that mean that it is no lectures and no tutorials altogether? The answer is no. Uh, we curate. That means we look at what the topic is. It depends on the subject. It depends on the profile of students that we are working with. And it is not a simple everything is seminar. Yes, we have seminars. Yes, we do have some cases where there are lectures. Uh, it is taken on a case-by-case -case basis. And as Mr. Ang had pointed out earlier, we are also... Uh, moving ahead with blended learning and with uh, ICT as part of support for edu uh, education. So all of these things come together to ensure that the child or the student is able to be a little bit more directed or autonomous in his or her learning and to be able to develop slowly that competence uh, that will set him or her in good stead in the years ahead. Okay. Um, if you think about universities, they too have moved away from a lecture tutorial system, right? So the pre-university, the JCs, would also uh, do well to ensure that this is done to make sure that the students are well prepared for university, whether it's in Singapore or overseas, right? There is a question on um, ECG counsellors in NJC. Uh, are there ECG counsellors at NJC and what is the support for school uh, in the process for application to UNIS US universities? Right. Um, we do have an ECG counsellor at NJC. Uh, the ECG counsellor works very closely uh, together uh, with the students and we also have a, uh, a teacher who is put in charge to take care of the applications for US universities for UK universities and so on and so forth. Uh, students have uh, a lot of space uh, to approach teachers, to ask them about how they might think about what they should pursue beyond the A-levels. And our teachers are very open to having deep conversations about how they should think through uh, uh, when applying to specific universities and when applying to specific uh, courses as well. Um, students can also, of course, speak with almost anyone in this college about this, not just their own teachers, right? So uh, it's not just the ECG counsellors that do this. Uh, it, it's an entire community that helps them with the applications. Um, and more importantly, not just the administrative portion of the application, but uh, thinking through what is really best for each child. Um, of course, uh, right now, the situation has changed. And, uh, whether U.S. universities are, of course, something that's as appealing as what it was before, that we do not know and we have to think through again. Um, I heard that there is boarding in NJC. Can I know more about it? Yes, we do have a very strong boarding program. Um, each term, uh, there will be a group of students from each cohort that boards. Since COVID, we have had to sort of put a halt on all boarding activities. That said, we are not going to have boarding in its full form this year. Uh, we are looking at how we can have uh, boarding-like experiences that will still afford uh, the same sort of learning for students. And yes, uh, there, we are looking into it and we are already thinking through what we can do for the current group of uh, JC2 students. Uh, when your child or when you come in, uh, we will also plan accordingly, right? The idea of boarding is to develop other elements of learning, the more social aspect, and to go beyond just the cognitive domain, to look at the effective, so the emotional side of things and the behavioral side of things. So in totality, boarding together with your CCA and of course your subjects will allow you to develop into that complete person, right? Right. Um, so there's a question on JE versus IP. Any difference between JE students and IP students in JC1 as far as background? Um, and will JE students be having a tough time to catch up compared to those from IP? Mm, we treat all students the same. I think we must know that every child can learn, every child will learn. Um, the IP experience is slightly different. The IP experience affords them uh, areas 
which the JE students also have their own uh, areas which the IP students don't have, right? So each student has a different set of experiences, but we do not think of those experiences as being different, but rather complementary, right? The IP students can learn from the JE students and vice versa as well. Um, there is no presumed knowledge when it comes to the academic domain. Uh, we ensure that everyone is on equal footing and more importantly, the key is to learn how to learn. I think that is something that we emphasize in order to take the best from the seminar structure and from the A-levels as a whole. So in terms of difference, of course, there'll be differences. There are differences within the IP students as well. But the question is whether we want to look at the differences as being disadvantages or advantages. And I think we, we frame it from an advantages point of view. Okay. Next question, it's about research. So what opportunities are available for students who are interested in conducting research specifically in economics? May I invite Ms. Lim uh, to talk a little bit about this? Ms. Lim, please. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. So uh, yes, there's opportunities for uh, conducting research in economics. Okay, other than science, mathematics, computing research, uh, we do have a group of teachers looking after students in the humanities and social science research. Okay, and uh, since you're coming in through the JC program, uh, some of you may be taking this research as a H3 level, okay? but you still can take research as enrichment. There'll be a more detailed sharing with all the students uh, once you join us about what are the different programs available, okay, and uh, the types of research that is available as a external research, which you will do research with the uh, ASTAR institutes or the different universities. We have also in-house research, okay, where you'll be mentored by our teachers and there will be research opportunities uh, right now will be online with international students. And uh, to take research as a history, okay, which will be part of your A-level cert, okay, of course, this would be uh, limited to a certain number of students, but everyone are uh, welcome to apply. Okay, you can take this as an A-level subject. Okay, for science research, you'll be taking it uh, during your JC one year and we call you uh, senior high one students, okay, when you're in NJ. But if you're going to take research as a H3 uh, for social science and econs, okay, you will only apply after your promo results are available. That means you have to make sure that you do very well for your promotional exams. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lim. Right, we have a question about uh, H2, uh, H2 subject. Is it possible to take biology as a H2 subject if she did not take biology as an O-level subject? Uh, we could, of course, talk about this in relation to prerequisites for all subjects. May I invite Mr. Teo to speak about this, please? Mr. Teo, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Joe. Okay, uh, regarding prerequisites to read certain subject at H2, uh, I again, I'd like to invite all of you to visit the National Junior College website uh, where the subject competitions offer is. So uh, again, if I share the screen, screen with all of you, okay, but allow me to orient you. Uh, so subjects that are in uh, yellow would be H2 level. Subjects that are white would be a H1 level. So to specifically answer uh, this uh, question, to read uh, if you do not have any uh, O-level uh, level biology background, uh, it is advised to consider other possible sciences instead. Okay, uh, but uh, and also the, the thing about reading a particular subject, H1 and H2, always, always remember to fall back on what are the objectives of reading this specific subject, H1 H2. And we always refer back to uh, courses available in the universities and the prerequisites to study the specific courses in the university. Okay, so uh, over here, we do offer uh, quite a number of subjects at both H1 and H2, and the prerequisites are all uh, stated in the website. Okay, uh, having said that, it does not imply that if you would like to read uh, biology and uh, a biology-related course in university, and you didn't read any subject H1, H2 in A-levels, uh, it doesn't imply that you are you know, uh, you're not given any opportunity to therefore read any related course in university. Well, there's always bridging courses uh, available in the universities. So again, you've got to refer back to the university websites. But 
uh, if you have already have the prerequisite, for example, you want to read some biological related courses in university and you had a H2 bio or H1 bio, okay, uh, it will be helpful. Okay, and then you probably will spend less time on bridging uh, the content and learning gap uh, in the university. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Theo. Um, just a little short point. Um, if you are thinking about this in the context of, let's say, medicine, uh, it's important to know what the prerequisites of different courses at university are. These things have changed over the years. So, for example, it is not necessary to have biology if you want to read medicine at the university. So I'm trying to see what's the, the intent behind the question. Uh, as what Mr. Teo had already talked about, uh, it's important to understand what you want to take away from the subject as well. And of course, there's a longitudinal view of what you want to do beyond the A-levels as well. So think through carefully and think through um, how what options might be available or not available if you do a particular set of subjects. So that's important. Okay. Mr. Ang, there's a question for Mr. Ang. Um, I hear that the facilities at NJC are a little bit dated or limited. Has there or will there be any plans to improve or upgrade the facilities? If so, by when? May I invite Mr. Ang to take this question, please? Um, thank you for the question. Um, can you hear me? For most junior colleges which have uh, you know built in the 1980s for example uh, my fellow junior colleges uh, Marse, Victoria Junior College and some other colleges uh, facilities have been improved over the years uh, let me give you some examples and how we intend to continue to improve the facilities number one um, we have uh, we, we to refurbish the track and field uh, and it is very new. We just finished it last year. Uh, most important, the classrooms, what we have done and what we intend to do. The classrooms are critical because it's a place where you gather and learn. Okay. What we will do in the very, very near future, I think by March, that we will put in uh, Apple TV right, uh, for, to promote learning in such a way that you know, students, as I said earlier, can work together as a team. Uh, technology will be the key. So in National Junior College, we focus a lot on how we improve the technology facilities. In terms of uh, Wi-Fi, uh, you do not have to worry. Uh, it will be freely available and uh, low length. Uh, we are going to improve on that. In terms of the classrooms, we have uh, converted some classrooms to seminars our rooms so that uh, seminars our classes can be uh, productive. Uh, in the classroom, as I've said earlier, we will leverage technology uh, and and put in the necessary equipment uh, uh, to help learning. Uh, when we say run down, I think uh, in Singapore schools, actually the facilities in any Singapore school uh, is of good order. Uh, you might not know, uh, every holiday, right, during the vacation, my students are at, ho at home, uh, there will be improvement works done. Right? Uh, what we have done so far is to, as I said, improve the classrooms uh, for students in terms of seating arrangement, in terms of what we put into the classroom. That is fundamental because most of your time was spent in the classroom. In terms of uh, CCA facilities, as I have said earlier, we have uh, uh, changed the field, school field, the track is new. Uh, the, uh, so-called CCA rooms for dance, for basketball, are generally very new. So does it affect students' learning? I think you have to look at it from a, diff a different point of view. What is most important to students' learning, as I said earlier, is actually the relationships between teachers and students, how lessons are conducted. Uh, what do you affect students' learning? I would say very minimally. Right, as long as we are able to uh, ensure that good teaching and learning takes place. So, the minimum facilities that we provide for the students will be enough in terms of uh, how classrooms lessons are conducted. And we are going way beyond that. Right? We are building uh, 
the technical facilities, right, in order to improve learning. So what is most important when we talk about facilities is that does it help students to improve their learning? And what do we do in order to help students to improve their learning is to ensure that delivery of uh, lessons, delivery of learning is done well through the various uh, facilities that we have. And we have and will continue to do that. Okay, as I said earlier, uh, we have uh, created seminar rooms. We have looked at uh, different parts of the school to convert certain rooms for better learning. So once a school is built, no school will stay static, right? As the curriculum changes, as the way we teach and learn change, we will look and say, this is how we can improve. So we have converted some rooms for students to learn on their own. Uh, the library is nice, a nice library. Uh, the children can go there yourself. As a student can go there to learn. So there is no shortage of uh, so called sufficient facilities. And let me be very uh, clear about this. That what a student needs, right, is not just the facilities, as I said earlier, it's how teaching and learning is being done. And teaching and learning is being done in such a way whereby students feel that they have the opportunity to learn well. Now, the question about two years A-level very fast paced. Um, it's really up to you to think through. As I said earlier in my first speech, um, really the, the A-levels, as you said, is, is very fast paced. The question is, what do you prioritize? So I have, uh, which I've advised my uh, students in uh, JC1 and JC2, or SH1 and SH2, there are three things you need to think about. Number one, right? What are your priorities? Okay. Everybody has 24 hours. Right? You, me, my colleagues, and JC students. How do you prioritize the 24 hours that you have? That's number one. Number two. Right, I've always given this equation to uh, students in NJC. They always hear this from me because I read this book many, many years ago. It talks about coaching in tennis. Right, performance. Remember this, even if you're not to join NJC, because it's good advice. Performance equals potential minus interferences. Right, performance equals potential minus interferences. So how you perform is not just based on your potential. It's also based on what interferes with what. You can do. As I said earlier, how do you prioritize? If you prioritize playing computer games as you continue your JC education, then it's a huge interference, and you will not able to you will not be able to realize potential, right? So your performance will therefore be affected. So whether it's fast pace or slow pace, it doesn't really matter if you have too many interferences. And the last point I make to my uh, NJC students is this. Perspective is everything, right? What perspective do you think? How you think and how you feel will lead you where you go. Very important again, right? If I have a very positive perspective about something, I will think positively and I will feel positive. If I have a negative perspective about things, right, I will feel negative and I will think negative. So when you ask this question very fast paced, it really depends on what I've said earlier. Three points. How do you prioritize? How do you uh, ensure that there are no interferences which affect your performance? And number three, what are your perspectives? If you think through this, then it's not so much about fast pace or slow pace. Because our belief in National Junior College is that every child can learn and every child will be able to achieve. It does not mean that every child has to score all A's. It's very good if you have to score all A's. But it means that you have done to the best of your ability with the help of our teachers. And there was a related question about uh, uh, A-level. How many of NJC students go to university? It's very clear, as I say. Once you come to a JC, like ours and actually junior college, we expect 100% to be able to make it to the university. Some, even in uh, all colleges, may not be able to make it even if the O-level results were very good because it was affected by what I said earlier. Too many interferences. The priorities in life change. So we need to ask ourselves this question, especially you when you join a junior college at 17 years old. I repeat, 
what are your priorities? How do you therefore perform? And what are your perspectives? For the results, National Junior College level results. Okay, students who come in, we have tracked the results over the years. Um, it has been value adding, meaning that you are you have most of the students in NJC perform better uh, after joining us based on the old level results. All right, we are very honest about it. We look at the results over the last two years. We have been improving in terms of the value added. Over the, yes, in fact, we have made improvements. We want to ensure that making improvement does not mean, uh, and I'm very upfront about this, does not mean that um, uh, it is uh, something that uh, is so easy to do. We have to look at how we innovate uh, uh, learning. The other thing I've also spoken about many times is when we say performance, uh, the question I always ask, how many students actually uh, go out there for tuition? Like besides coming to school, how many students go out there? So we look at the figures and say, and my frank view is this, right? If we teach well enough in school, there may not be a necessity for students to go for tuition. I actually do not advocate tuition because it is quite a high cost for many students. I advocate good teaching, good learning, prioritizing, right? Removing your interferences, taking the right perspective, and you do well. So this is what is important. You yourself wanting to know what you need to do in order to perform well at the levels. Okay? Right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ang. Uh, if I may touch a little bit more about uh, facilities. So Mr. Ang has already talked about what's crucial to a child's education. Um, for facilities, rest assured, they are sufficient to afford opportunities for students to learn. For example, our research facilities are there for students to explore a range of topics. Uh, there, is agri there are agri-tech facilities, there are a bunch of equipment for, for students to do a range of uh, experiments so that they are able to explore whatever they are, almost anything that they are interested in. Um, what's crucial is still how they learn and uh, to be able to develop that ability to, to, to drive themselves to want to learn. Okay. There's a question on DSA, uh, and I'll put this together with uh, a question on CCA. Um, some are asking about when DSA will start uh, for 2022, if I'm not wrong. Uh, at least that's what I interpret from the question. Um, this will sort of begin somewhere in the middle of the year, around May, June. Uh, please uh, look, uh, look at our website. We will have the necessary information uh, uploaded uh, at a, in a timely way. Okay, we will also broadcast uh, on our social media platforms. Okay, uh, in similar vein, there's a question about uh, the number of CCAs students are expected to take and the duration and how many days a week. May I invite Ms. Tan, our HOD for CCA and PE, to, to take this question, please, Ms. Tan? Hi. Hello. Uh, thanks, Haman. Uh, I think I, I noticed a few uh, questions with regard to uh, CCA, so I'll try to answer as many as I can. Um, with regard to whether uh, our senior high students uh, must take a CCA, so it's mandatory for us, for the, our senior high students to be involved in at least one CCA. Uh, we in highly encourage this to be school-based uh, so that they can make friends, one in their interactions, and our teachers, our CCA teachers do uh, guide them under our CCA framework, which uh, includes uh, character development and uh, uh, teaching them how to handle uh, um, issues under different circumstances. So, um, whether or not they want to choose to take a, another CCA, that's really up to them if they can cope. Uh, in, on top of that, the, our student council is a leadership body. It's considered a leadership body, it's not considered a CCA. Uh, so they may choose to join that as well, right, on top of their CCA. Um, the frequency from, and number of sessions and duration of the, C, uh, of the CCA ranges from CCA to CCA, from term to term. It's typically around uh, two to three sessions a week or for maybe two to three hours. Of course, this increases or decreases as, it, as we approach, as we, as we approach the SYF or the national school games. 
Um, of course, close, closer to the assessment weeks or the examinations, uh, this, will decrease, this, this will decrease as well. Uh, I think there were a few questions with regard to the individual CCA like debate, Chinese calligraphy, or which is under CLDDS. Uh, for more information on this, um, uh, you, you can go to our website. It's under, uh, under experience CCA. Each of our CCA has an individual website with uh, further details. Uh, with regard to the question on this tag, we're actually streamlining some of CCAs at the moment. Uh, so CCAs such as BizTech, Science and Technology, Math Society, Piano Ensemble, their programs, we are having their programs subsumed under the various academic departments. So uh, these uh, CCAs, um, this will not be considered CCAs uh, uh, moving forward. So I think uh, that's all from me for the moment. Uh, back to you. Thank you, Ms. Tan. Um, we, we again go back to the question of what, what CCA is for and um, what do you hope to get out of the CCA experience. Uh, there's a social factor, there's also the part of owning skills. Um, so think through about what CCAs are meant to do, especially at this age group. Right. Mm. Okay, Mr. Theo, you're up next. There's a question on prerequisites for humanity. Um, and you could take the next question as well about the school start time and end time for senior high students, especially those who are reading biochemistry and math. Uh, Mr. Teo, please. Hello, uh, I'm back again. Now, uh, regarding subject of uh, prerequisites such as uh, history and literature, Hi, I'm back again. Uh, regarding uh, prerequisites to read uh, humanities subjects such as history and literature, uh, you do not need to read history or literature at O level in order to do so uh, at A levels. However, it's important that uh, you do have a good command in English so that uh, because due to the nature of assessments in these kind of subjects, uh, they are usually uh, a lot of uh, essays involved, requires a lot of critical thinking and a lot of analysis. So your command in English has to be good. Okay, now uh, I think there was another question about uh, uh, is it possible for this child to read a specific subject uh, if he or she does not meet the prerequisites. I think it's important that again, uh, go through the uh, career counselling and the various kinds of courses available in the university with your child and uh, therefore think carefully. Will there you know about the time, the learning skills your child has, the gaps, uh, your child's strengths and weaknesses. Think carefully, and because uh, not only let's say you don't you don't have you don't you are unable to read the biology example uh, at A level, then how much time is required to catch up on the content gap compared to the O level students? And don't forget, your child has to read other subjects. You know, uh, there's general paper. There are three other subjects. There's a uh, mother tongue. There's project work. There are many other commitments in this uh, in. Uh, studying in junior college. So it's in, it's, we cannot just focus on just one subject and then uh, improve or uh, decrease the content and skills gap. Okay, so it's important. I think you better have a good work with your child uh, to know what causes they, she or she wants and possible uh, alternative uh, if he or she is unable to take up the specific course in the university. Okay, now regarding uh, uh, studying time, how much time uh, a specific uh, subject combi uh, will take up in school. Allow me to share a screen with all of you. Okay, so uh, typically school starts at about uh, 8 a.m. Okay, uh, 8 a.m. But uh, we will we'll like students to report earlier, say 7.40 a.m. for attendance taking and temperature taking. Okay, and um, if you uh, so on Monday, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, we will start school at about 7.40 a.m. And on Thursdays, you can start school at 8.40 a.m. Okay, now how does a, how long is a typical school day? Okay, uh, instead of considering a day, I'll, if you look at the screen there, uh, is, I'm, I've broken it out in terms of weeks. Okay, and each of the column represents a certain subject combination. So uh, specifically to biochem math econs, if you can look at the left screen. Okay, the equivalent probably will be the physics, chem, math, and econs. Okay. Typically, uh, a student will spend about 31.4 hours okay, per week in class learning these subjects. Okay, so subjects will also include uh, PE and CCE. And I'm assuming that uh, this student has yet cleared 
the higher mother tongue at O level. So he or she will have to read the H1 mother tongue. Okay, now 31.4 hours per week would roughly mean uh, divided by five is about six, six hours per day. However, um, this does not include okay, the uh, additional 10% of the time that your, uh, the student will have to do online learning. Okay, so you probably have to add about 10 more percent to more. So this amounts to about probably 35 to 36 hours per week instead. Okay, and then uh, don't forget that CCA. So CCAs typically start at about 3.40 p.m. to about uh, 4 p.m. Uh, 4 p.m. and it will last about three hours or so. Okay, uh, depending on which CCA and which other CCA days. Now, does that mean that in between uh, this student will not have to do anything, you know, and can enjoy himself or herself? Well, it depends. Uh, Typically, senior high one students okay, will have to read project work. Okay, and uh, in order to perform well in project work, there needs to be a lot of discussion, a lot of online research is required. So you probably would like to spend those breaks in between to do to go online to do further research so that your group will have a group or will have a fantastic project to present at the end of the year. So I hope I've explained, uh, I have uh, discussed this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Teo. Um, there's a question about um to, for us to clarify the difference between seminar, tutorial, lecture. Uh, one way to think about it is also the size of the number of students involved, right? Previously, I had spoken about um, seminars being a little bit more engaging, where students are afforded time and space to have discussion and to work on problems together with their peers. Uh, for a lecture, it is more didactic, where a, a lecturer would speak. For a tutorial, yes, there's a, a lot more of you know, the usual going through uh, how the problems are solved and so on and so forth. A seminar sits somewhere in between. In similar vein, a seminar in terms of size sits somewhere in between a lecture and a tutorial. This, so if you put both lectures and tutorials together, somewhere in between you get a seminar. So when students are engaged continually in a seminar setting, um, the, the teachers, their tutors would have a, a better understanding and would be able to have to forge that relationship which is crucial to be to, to understanding what each child needs in the context of learning rather than just simply focus on the subject itself but go beyond it what elements of knowing how to learn what elements of um, learning how to live that self-mastery that's required for students to survive and even thrive uh, beyond the a levels itself so a seminar for example there are different um, instructional models that are used. There's team-based learning, there's problem-based learning, so different types of focus or elements that go into the pedagogy or instruction for uh, each lesson. Now, are there tutorials? Like, uh, yes, there will be. It depends on the setting, it depends on the subject, it depends on the topic. If we feel that something is a little bit more involved or there's a little bit more challenge, then it might make sense to break the group up even further. If something is uh, where it's basically information dissemination, then you would think that, okay, maybe a lecture would serve the purpose. Uh, Mr. Teo had just spoken about uh, blended learning. Uh, that 10% is perhaps more for a lesson preview to help students prepare for the lesson so that when they get to class, they are more engaged in looking at problems and in interacting and looking at things from different perspectives. If you want to develop that sort of rigor in thinking, there must be perspectives, there must be questions asked, the question assumptions, uh, to look at what data is available and so on and so forth. So some knowledge acquisition, learning a little bit about the content of the topic before getting to class will help. And that's our blended learning model uh, in conjunction with our uh, seminar model. All right. Um, the next question is if we offer TAMO as a H2 subject? The answer, yes. Um, we are an MLEP and TLEP school. That is Tamil Language Elective Program and Malay Language Elective Program, respectively. Uh, that means that our students do Tamil Language and Literature uh, and Malay Language and Literature uh, as part of their, one of their H2 subjects. Um, they are also eligible for MOE pre-U scholarships, for example, the Tamil language elective scholarship and the Malay language elective scholarships. Uh, to find out more about this, of course, they could speak with uh, our teachers when they come 
uh, to NJSE, or they could speak with their teachers at secondary school, they would know a little bit more. And there is also an MOE briefing on the 12th, Tuesday. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm doing it for memory. <laughs> There's a briefing on 12th of January. There is information on our website with regard to that. Okay, so uh, we are a TLEP and an MLEP school. In that sense, the LEP stands for Language Elective Program. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I think it's uh, again, very, again, very critical to really talk about really why, talk about why we are. Uh, moving to different modes of uh, teaching and learning. Uh, one of the key factors uh, that needs to really innovate in teaching and learning is really the A-level examinations. We have to be very upfront about it. The A-level examinations at the end of the day are the most critical. And it is very necessary for us to prepare you to be ready for the A-level examinations. Over the years, the types of questions, the way questions are asked in the A-level examinations have changed uh, to something more requiring you to think a lot more, requiring you to be able to answer questions in a quicker way. And my colleagues and I have uh, talked about this. How do we better prepare uh, NJCNs to sit for the A-level examinations so that um, they can do well enough? And that is the aim, right? That you do well for A levels. You come in with a certain number of points, we expect you to be able to do perform up to a certain level. Of course, there are personal factors, as I mentioned earlier, right? Your interferences, your prioritization, and so on. But on our part as teachers, we must learn how also to teach you better. And therefore, we talk about seminar style. Mr. Harman talks about, you know, there are classes which are conducted classroom style. The most important question is how do we prepare you in terms of sitting for the final examinations? And we found that the methods that we are adopting now uh, will help better prepare you for the examinations. Right? The thinking strategies, the learning strategies, the self mastering strategies that will help you. And we are always careful about this and we're always thinking about this how to help a student learn better right when they learn better students will be able to better perform examinations they will have the confidence they will have the ability they will have the knowledge to do well so for performing well in examinations right comprises a whole host of factors number one okay have you learned well enough number two are you confident of yourself, right? Many students don't do well enough because of lack of confidence. Yes. So we want to build confidence. When we have a certain way of teaching and learning, it helps you to build confidence. You might not be aware of it, right? Now, when you are in secondary school, I have to be very frank. They just tell you everything, right? They just build your knowledge. The O-level examinations are actually quite different from the A-level examinations. The O-level examinations perhaps demand a style of preparing you but the a level examinations demands or demand another way of preparing you for the examinations so when we talk about uh JE students and IT students right uh, the preparation and when you come together you will learn from one another because the way you are prepared for taking certain types of assessment right i use the very bottom term types of assessments will be different and here because we have learned from how we prepare our IP students and what we need to do in order to help you prepare yourselves for the A level examinations. So think of what we are doing in this aspect, helping you to learn well and therefore, importantly, do well. And that's the reason why we are constantly innovating, whether it's the use of ICT, whether it's the use of, um, uh, you know, um, discussions that is as I, my colleague said earlier team-based learning and so on is give to to provide you with different modalities of learning so that you can be ready and most importantly i always believe and it's true uh, that you have confidence when you go sit for the examinations that's what it's all about 
and we do not apologize for them. Right? We want you to do well. That's critical. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ang. Um, the next question is about research. And if there are if research or the research opportunities are open to all students, um, and whether research can be considered as a subject. In fact, the answer is yes, there is a subject. Uh, can I invite Ms. Lim to speak about this, please? Ms. Lim? Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Joe. Okay, so uh, yes, research is open to all the students to opt in. Uh, however, I have to share that there will be a selection process because the different research programs will have their uh, prerequisite. Some of the research programs are offered by external partners. So they do set some criteria and uh, you have to go through the selection process. There will be an interview process internally or by the external uh, mentors who will be offering this project. So will research be considered an, another subject? If you are taking research as an enrichment, uh, it will be an on additional subject. Uh, sorry, it will be just an enrichment program. It will not be part of your curriculum. However, if you are taking research as a H3 subject, uh, it will be part of your A-level cert. So for example, if you are taking science research as H3, uh, you will still have to take your uh, two different H2 science subjects. So, and then you will have a third H3 subject. Okay, so uh, maybe let me repeat this. You'll be still taking your uh, three H2s, one H1, okay, out of which uh, most of it should be science if you are taking a H3 science research. And then there will be an additional H3 research subject. If you're going to take a H3 research as a humanities or social science project, then of course you should be also offering, say, H2 economics, and then you can offer H3 economics research. Okay, uh, but all students are welcome to sign up for all these research programs uh, subjected to, of course, the selection process. Do you have to then, uh, if you want to sign up for this, this question, if I want to join a science research course in university, is it compulsory to take one of the H3 subjects in science research with A star NTU? Uh, the answer is no, right? Uh, you just have to go to the NUS NTU uh, SIT uh, University Courses uh, website and you can take a look. The prerequisites actually do not need H3. H3 is an additional uh, research subject that you may want to take okay, to stretch yourself further to find out more about a certain subject or a certain field that you are passionate about. Okay, To go into any of the university courses, you just have to uh, fulfill the prerequisite that is written on their websites. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lim. Um, again, think about what does research offer? Why do you want to do research? It's not, I don't think any university would place uh, a premium on you doing research per se. Uh, however, think about the skills and dispositions that you are able to develop in the research process. The ability to think, ask deep questions, question your assumptions, do experiments, prove that the experiments are, or validate the experimental results, and of course, ultimately, to be able to communicate that work effectively so that others might uh, take some joy in your, you discovering some new knowledge. Um, that ultimately is what academia is about and what the research process affords. So again, think through what research affords you in terms of uh, learning about you, about yourself, and of course, about the domain that you're interested in. Uh, a second point to make about research is, uh, given the COVID situation, we had to sort of put a halt on some experience, research experiences, especially with partners uh, beyond NJC. Uh, students within NJC, of course, could carry on with their work at NJC, uh, but we will have to monitor this quite closely and work with the IHLs, uh, right? So this year, we are starting again, um, and hopefully it will resume as what we had seen it to be in the years before uh, 2020. Okay. Um, there is a question for 
on uh, H2 subjects? Uh, before we continue uh, to answer some of the questions, let me just provide uh, another um, answers to some of your very broad questions. Uh, I think one critical question is uh, what are the opportunities as, uh, for JE students for CCA? Uh, let me put this to you this way. We are blind to whether you are JE student or IP student with regard to leadership positions in CCAs. We have had students from JE who have become president of the Students' Council, uh, be captain of a, a team, and be a team leader. So we are blind. What is most important, right, for those of you who are interested in leadership positions is to demonstrate uh, that you have the ability. Uh, it doesn't really matter when you are, whether you are an IP or JAE student. What matters, as I said, is your own personal convictions, uh, your own personal values, uh, and what you can do for others. Leadership is about what you can do for others, not for yourself. It is not self-glorifying. Uh, uh, so-called endeavor. It is about uh, being there for others. I think uh, if you have watched the American politics, but you realize that you know um, leadership is really not about ourselves. It's really about doing good for others. And this is what we stand for in National Junior College: service with honor. Uh, so this is very important, right? Do not worry about this. I think there's also another question about promotion to the next level. Now, in National Junior College, I have uh, said to my colleagues, and, and I think we are all in this together, that we set assess assessments for promotion to from JC1 to JC2, SH1 to SH2, that is fair, right? Examinations where we set uh, assessments, I want to let you know, uh, if you have not known that already, it's about validity and reliability. Yeah, it's not about whether it's hard or easy, right? Uh, a valid and reliable assessment Important. What does that mean? That means we must only test you on what you have learned. We don't test you beyond what you have learned, right? We will grade you according to a certain set of rubrics, right? So for uh, last year's students, actually one student asked me this. Uh, uh, I heard that this examinations are not so hard because so many of us, in fact, almost everyone went on to the next level. My answer, as I have said earlier, is this. It's not whether it's hard or easy, it's whether you have learned enough, learned well, and we will set uh, assessments which are reliable and valid. And make sure that you have learned and that you are ready to go on to the next level. We are not out there to kill you, right? It's not about killing you, it's about whether you have learned enough or learned well. And I think that depends on you, right? It depends on, as I said, go back to my three points, your interferences, your perspective, your priority. How do you make full use of the 24 hours? Okay, so here in National Junior College, we think through these issues. It's really not about killing the students. It's really not about uh, setting examinations that are so hard. It's about fundamentally learning and ultimately what you can do after the two years to sit for your A-level exams, confident that you're able to do well. This is what we are about. Okay, so I hope I've answered some of your questions regarding promotion, regarding CCAs. We are IPJE blind with regard to CCAs, leadership positions and so on. That's the reason why I said earlier, we want you to talk about your experiences with the IP students so that you share experiences, you learn from one another. And to us, this is very, very important. Okay. So thank you very much again for all those questions. They are very good questions. And we want to answer them in, a, in an honest, transparent, and open manner so that you know exactly what we stand for. We don't want to sell you anything. We want to tell you what we think, how we think, what is our education philosophy, how do we want to uh, interact with students, how we want to students to develop, and how we want you, when you come to NDC, to feel. Because we want you to feel good we want you to feel that you're happy here. We want you to be joyful when you learn despite the challenges that you will face. Definitely, you will face some challenges because you can transition from uh, JAE or uh, secondary school to uh, junior college is never easy. You need to work hard. That is 
um, basic if I remember. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ang. Um, there are a bunch of questions uh, pertaining to qualifying tests for various subjects at school and uh, reading certain subjects at uh, JC. Uh, can I invite Mr. Teo to speak about these? Mr. Teo, please. Uh, sorry, before I talk about the qualifying tests and uh, 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 qualifying tests for various subjects, there was a question about uh, bringing personal learning device because I'm, I'm, I'm handling the uh, ICT here. So the question was about do we need to bring the personal learning device every day? The answer is, well, it depends on how the teachers want to design the lesson. So either you can always check with your teachers in advance, hey, do I need to bring the laptop or do I need to bring the iPad? So if the answer is no, then there's no need to. But if there is a need to, you just have to bring. Okay, so it's really dependent on the subject per se, the nature of the subject, the nature of the learning. Okay, and how do you want to plan your learning after uh, dismissal? So some of you may want to stay back in school to do more uh, online reading or to do project work. Maybe your device would be useful. But perhaps some of you just want to consult teachers uh, face to face consultation, then there's no, there, you've got to think again. Okay, so uh, now I'll go back to uh, qualifying tests. Okay, so there was a question about uh, whether there's a qualifying test for H2 biology, H2 maths. The answer is no, there's no qualifying test for these two subjects. So, uh, again, allow me to refer you to the National Junior College website about the subject prerequisites. So, over here uh, at the subject prerequisites website, okay, uh, you can see what are the subjects that have a qualifying test and which subjects do not have a qualifying test. Again, uh, I'd like all of you to think through, if you want to have, if you want to take up a certain subject, right, and you perhaps have a content, a huge content gap, you've got to think carefully because you only have that amount of time every day. Okay, and we are talking about A-levels now versus O-levels, so it's going to be quite a huge job. Uh, if uh, you are already behind, okay, perhaps not having certain uh, prerequisites, okay, Think about the amount of time you need to catch up. And uh, Ms. Tang was mentioning just now about uh, learning not joyfully in school. So we would like all students to actually be able to cope with their learning in school than to struggle with their learning in school. So all, uh, all these have to take into a consideration. And again, I have to emphasize that it's not just one subject you need to look after. There are many, many other subjects that you need to consider. Okay. Uh, there was a question about further math, whether uh, how to choose further math. So to choose uh, further math or to choose further math, basically uh, you just you know come to National Junior College and opt that as one of the possible subjects okay, that you want to consider. However, do note further math has a prerequisite and there's a, there is a qualifying test that will be administered in National Junior College. Again, I'd like you to refer to the National Junior College website to look out for the specific subjects that will have a qualifying test. So uh, apart from further math, computing, knowledge and inquiry, art, music, uh, I think these are the subjects that will have the, uh, and so on, will have qualifying tests that's administered on National Junior College, and they will be administered on the 1st of February. Okay. Uh, I think uh, that, that's about it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tsui. Yeah. So, uh, if you if you need to find out what require uh, what are the prerequisites for any particular subject combination, please uh, look at our website. And if you're uncertain, please uh, email the school, and we'll address uh, you as best as we can. Okay. Um, we uh, coming to the end of this Q and A session. The next session will be Q and A with students, so they can find out uh, from them what school life is all about. Um, uh, we'll close this session um, with talking about how do you balance learning for life and learning for the exams. I have always told all students this. Um, if you learn well, you will do well. Um, it, it's, of course, a very easy, perhaps even a sweeping statement to make. But if you focus more on learning, really being honest, being intellectually honest with yourself and knowing, okay, I... I understand something. Can I teach it to someone else? Uh, how well have I tried this? Have I tried this in different situations? When you are true to that, you will do well because you have truly learned. Um, yes, we know that the runway from February to next October is a short one. 
but that's part of education. Education is about reshaping beliefs. It's not just disseminating information and just dumping content and spewing it out. It's about you reshaping, remanaging, regulating your beliefs and how you perceive self and others in the context of how you learn. Um, you do that well, and it's something we focus a lot on, uh, not just uh, incidentally, but pervasively. Um, you, every child will be able to succeed. And it is continual. That has to occur beyond JC life as well. So we focus on learning for life, and we know that that in itself will allow them to learn for the exams as well. That was a, okay, I think one more question. We, we have time for one more question or one comment. Okay, um, please stay on for the student Q&A. Um, you can find out firsthand. You can ask them anything about what uh, school life is about, what college life is about. Uh, from CCAs to their learning experiences and so on and so forth uh, after this. And um, if you would like, you could join us again for another round of Q&A uh, next Tuesday, which is 12th January, same time from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, I, I thank our panelists for joining us, um, Ms. Tan, Ms. Lim, uh, Ms. Ng, uh, Mr. Teo, and Mr. Ang. Thank you and have a great day ahead.
I'm Lee Chow, and I will be your moderator for today. With us on the panel are six very passionate and lively NJCNs, which I'm sure will be more than happy to answer your questions later. First up, let us introduce our alumni students, beginning with Joel. Hello, Joel. Hello, Leicha. Hi, everyone. I'm Joel from the class of 2020. I'm a JE student and I taught BCME H1 Accounts. I was also in Student Council at Interact Club. Yep, thank you so much, Joel. Next up, we have Chelsea. Good morning, everyone. I'm Chelsea. I was from the class of 2020 as well. Um, I was very actively involved in science research in my years in NJC, and I also took H3 chemistry. So these are some things that you can ask about if you're interested. All right, thank you so much, Chelsea. Next up, we have Joanna. Hi, I'm Joanna. I'm also from the class of 2020. I took biochemistry, math, and geography, and I'm also in track and field. Additionally, I've also been in student council for three years. All right, that's it for our alumni. Now, moving on to our current SH2 students. First up, let's have Tinking to introduce himself. Hello, Hello. Tinking. Hello, I'm an SH2. I'm taking the art stream this year. And my council is, uh, my CCA is ELDDES. Yes, thank you so much, Tengheng, for introducing yourself. Next up, Waishan. Hey, everyone. I'm Waishan, and I'm also a JE student, and I'm in council, and I've joined debate, and I take PCME. Yes, thank you so much, Waishan. And lastly, we have Andrea Sibi. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrea. I take the conventional PCME for H2s, and I'm from debate. Thank you so much, Andrea. And those are all of our panelists. So if you have any questions later, please feel free to leave them in our Facebook live stream comments and in our YouTube live chat. All right. So without further ado, let us begin with our student panel live Q&A session. So first up, I see a question by Carol Yap. And Carol Yap's question is, are there any subjects that are being taught at classroom style instead of seminar style? So could we have Waishan to answer this first question, please? Sure. Thank you, Leicha. So for classroom style lessons, we do have uh, multiple subjects offering tutorial based lessons, which will be done in classrooms where you are face to face with a teacher in a small group of about 20 to 30 students, depending on how big your class size is. And they'll be able to help you individually. And the, you can ask the teachers uh, for help with the questions that they are giving you. And they'll go through different uh, example questions or they'll go through tutorial questions, they could go through even papers. So we do have uh, multiple subjects such as uh, econs. So econs is done in a classroom, but it's, it's also done in a seminar style. And we also have mathematics, which is done uh, in a classroom. And sometimes we do have lectures, which will be done either online or in a lecture theater. Uh, we have physics and uh, most of your subjects will have tutorials. So most of your subjects will be done in classroom style. So that is not a worry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Raishan, for sharing. Um, next up, we have a question by God Godson. All right, and Godson's question is, 
Hi, what is the requirement for taking four H2 subjects? So could we have um, Joanna to answer this question? Hi, okay, so for 4H2 subjects, it really depends on whether you're applying for the science stream or for the art stream. So for the science stream, generally, for any science subjects, you require to have taken them at all levels, be it pure science or combined science. Additionally, if you are looking for more information, you can always check them out on National Juniors College website as there's more information over there. And also for a special subjects such as English language and literature, or arts or music, there's also an additional selection test that will be taking place on the 1st of February from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Yeah, thank you so much, Joanna, for sharing. Next up, um, we have a question by Royal. Uh, and Royal question, Ro Royal's question is, may I know how to take H3 subjects? So since Chelsea actually took a H3 subject, could Chelsea share, please? Okay, I will share about H3 subjects. So for H3 subjects, there are actually two main groups, one being H3 research and the other being H3 content subjects. So in terms of H3 research, you are able to apply for them during orientation, which is when you come in around in early February. So you apply for H3 research and the commitment is generally about one year. Whereas for H3 content subjects, they are actually dependent on your, on your promotional exam performance. So Based on how well you perform at the promotional exams, the school will offer you certain subjects that you are able to take at H3 level and you will be able to apply for these subjects. So these subjects can vary in terms of um, MOE-based H3 subjects where they are usually held in school or actually university-based H3 subjects where you take, a module at, um, you take a module at a university. So in short, how, how you can take a H3 subject is via application either at the start of um, JC1 for H3 research or at the end of JC1 for H3 content subjects? I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you so much, Chelsea, for sharing. Next up, we have a question right here. And, this, and the question is, um, what are the prerequisites for humanity subjects such as history and literature? So Ting would you like to share about the prerequisites for, human, for these humanity subjects? Sure. So for humanities subjects, there are actually no subject prerequisites from O-levels, meaning that you can take these subjects even if you only took science subjects in the O-levels. The reason for this is because for humanities subjects, there's much more of a skills focus compared to a content focus, and these skills are transferable across different subject domains. So if you're interested in the art subject, do feel free to consider taking them as your contrasting subject or even as your mainstream if you are considering uh, pursuing these subjects in the future. Yeah, thank you so much, Ting for sharing. Um, actually, I think that a lot of you might, actually, might be interested in what the NJPW experience is like. And I actually see this question, um, which, is, which, asks, uh, which you are requ re requesting for us to talk about our PW experiences. So could we get Andrea to share about her PW experience, please? Definitely, Lei Chao. So PW is a new subject for all our JC1 friends. We will start off with, um, you know, at the start of the year, we'll actually have um, a few seminars um, allowing us to um, ease into the subject for us to have a better understanding of what PW is like and how it would work. So um, technically, PW um, every year would actually consist of two questions. You can choose one from each. Um, so in my batch, it was either network or disruption. And um, you can actually choose a question and you would have to work with your mentor as well as your group mates for you to be able to find a project related to that question. Um, of course, definitely do not worry. Your mentors will always be there to guide you. And um, as for how your groupings are selected, we will actually have a series of tests conducted by our teachers to actually find the best suited group. Um, in terms of working style as well as um, the group dynamics. So um, from my personal experience, my group was actually well suited for me because all of us were of these uh, were of these of similar thinking, I would say, and we were able to well um, well communicate with each other, which is a vital part of PW. At the end of the day, I think PW is all about teamwork and learning how to adapt to certain situations, be it when you face challenges or um, when you face obstacles, when you're whether you're able to work with your group mates or your teachers and effectively overcome these um, circumstances. And um, Honestly speaking, be rest assured, your mentors will always be there to like guide you along the way. So you, you would not have to be um, worried at all as long as you put in your best and put in that time and effort. Um, 
be rest assured you will do well in PW and also enjoy the experience. Yep. All right. Thank you so much, Andrew, for sharing. So um, we've covered quite a lot of questions about subject combinations and subjects in NJC. So um, let us take a let us now answer some questions regarding um, CCAs in NJC. So there's actually this question, um, and this question over here is um, asking whether or not CCAs are compulsory to be taken. So the short answer is yes. It is it is necessary to take a CCA in NJC, and um, we actually have student we actually have panelists who are from the different cca groups right here on our student panel live q a session so um could we get joanna to share more about the sports C about what is it what, about what it is like to be in a sport cca joel to share more about what it is like to be in the clubs and societies and chelsea to share more about what it is like to be in a to be in a performing arts cca so let us begin with joanna Okay, so for me, I was in track and field for the last six years. So I've been in it since secondary school. And for me, it was quite a fulfilling experience. I think beyond just running and having fun, it was a really good stress reliever for me. So every time I felt stressed, I always felt like a lot of this, I can just like release it all when I was on the track. And apart from that, I think what I really enjoyed about the track environment was that a lot of our teachers used to be ex-runners. And I think it's quite similar for quite a lot of other CCAs, where a lot of them were used to be like national so it's really fun in the sense that your teachers are also there running alongside with you. They don't feel like, oh, it's just them standing there just being coaches. But they're also like, in a way, they feel like your teammates too. And I think throughout track, I also really learned a lot about resilience and also how to push myself beyond like my own limits. So it really pushed me to uh, fight my what, mental and physical challenges. And I think it was a really, really uh, good six years for me. And apart from that, I think for other sports CCAs, a lot of them will share similar uh, experiences as me. And generally, sports CCAs are about two times a week. They normally, as we end school around three or four o'clock, we normally start CCA about four or 4.30 and end by 6.30 or 7. And for some sports CCAs, such as hockey and canoeing, due to uh, the re various resources needed, they normally go outside of NJ to train. So canoeing sometimes goes to either Kalang Reservoir or they also go to McRitchie and hockey would also go to the nearby Evans Road uh, CCA branch. And I think for me, sports CCAs, although it seems quite tiring at the end of the day, especially when you reach home and you still have to uh, wash up, eat dinner and also uh, do your homework, I think at the end of the day, what we take away from that is a lot, it's very fulfilling and I think it's very worthwhile. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Joanna, for sharing. Next up, could we have Joelle to share about the clubs and societies in NJC? Okay, hi. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Lei Chao. So I was an interact club and so first thing i'll just share about why i decided to join interact club so i personally am in student council and i also have external commitments outside of school so i decided to take on a cca that is less time consuming as i wanted to ensure that i could manage all of my commitments well which is why i decided to do interact because not only will it have a low amount of commitment but it's also something that i truly enjoy and allows me to give back to my society and my community the specific um, activity that I did while I was in Interact was volunteering at a student care centre and I really enjoyed it because I found it extremely meaningful and even though we were NCCA pretty late on at about 7pm on Wednesdays, it didn't feel tiring in a sense because I felt like I was very fulfilled and I felt like I've you know, made someone's day when I was at the student care centre, which is why I really enjoyed it. So I think for um, JC especially, when you're choosing a CCA, one thing to take note of is the commitment hours for your CCAs, for other academic um, commitments you have or any external commitments that you have so that you're able to manage your time well because for sure you will get pretty hectic when you, when you enter JC so that is definitely one thing that you, you should take into consideration. Secondly, of course, choose something that you enjoy. This is probably one of the last few times you'll be able to join like a CCA or like a group game, group sports. So do um, choose something that you're interested in, do something that you know you will enjoy and allow your CCA to be a way for you to relax and de-stress because JC will get pretty hectic. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much, Joel, thank for you. sharing. Next up, can we have Chelsea to share more about what it is like to be in a performing arts CCA in NJC? So, Chelsea, please. Okay, thank you, Lei Chao, and thank you for your question. So, for some context, I was in the Chinese orchestra wing of the Chinese orchestra and coaching ensemble in NJC. So, I've been in this CCA for five years since the start of secondary two. And I think that um, the reason why I decided to stay in a performing arts CCA is because I was able, the sense of camaraderie that you have when performing with 
a group of very like-minded people, when everyone is breathing at the same rate, for instance, I think it's something that is really, really very... You feel like you always have a team and a family to support you no matter where you go, no matter what you do. And it's in CO, Chinese Orchestra, that I really found a group of friends that I was able to depend on. They really supported me throughout my years in NJC um, through all the different commitments and difficult times that I had. So I think that that's why I decided to stay in a performing arts CCA and that's what I really got out of it. Beyond the resilience that Joanna talked about, beyond the stress relief that Joel talked about, there was this sense of family that I was able to take away from my time in a performing arts CCA. So granted, um, it may be tiring at times because um, our regular trainings are twice a week for about two to three hours. And when we are close to the Singapore Youth Festival, um, there might be more practices throughout the, there might be more practices about three to four times a week, depending on the different CCAs. But I would say that it is still very manageable in the sense that the teachers are there for you. They are there to make sure that you are not um, over text. They are there to make sure that you are able to cope with whatever you do. So I think that a performing arts CCA is definitely manageable even at the JC level. And I think that um, like just to tie up what everyone has said about CCA, I think that CCA is compulsory because it definitely strengthens us as people in terms of our character and also gives us an area in which we can develop our skills that is not just our academic work to make sure that we are able to develop as people and not just as learners. So this is why I think that the CCA program in NJC is something that has definitely been a very integral part of my experience in NJ. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Chelsea, for sharing. Sorry, I was muted just now. Uh, thank you so much, Chelsea, for your question. So um, right now, we actually have a question um, that, it, that asks about the possibility of taking up multiple CCAs. So could we kindly have Waishan to answer this question, please? Definitely. Thank you, Lei Chong. So it is possible for you to take up multiple CCAs. So you can take up two CCAs in NJ. And however, there are, of course, multiple factors to consider when taking up uh, two CCA. So firstly, do consider the workload that you have because having two CCA means that you need to deal with more responsibilities and more uh, nuances to handle and all the different activities that both the CCAs give, right? So uh, for example, I do have friends who joined uh, both a sports CCA and a club CCA and they have to be, uh, they have to contribute equally in both CCAs. So you all, you will also need to, secondly, you also need uh, approval by one of your core CCA teachers. So the, teach the CCA teachers in charge need to uh, approve you taking two CCAs because of the higher commitment. And afterwards, you also, of course, need to consider whether these uh, commitments are something that you would like to uh, take up uh, compared to doing something else. Because if you take up more time with more CCAs, then you lose time for doing other things. So it's like, uh, it's like an opportunity cost, yeah. So uh, aside from that, uh, you also have to consider. Uh, uh, <laughs> you also have to consider your interest in the CCAs. So it is possible for you to take up more than one CCA, and it's just whether you have approval and whether you'll be able to manage the workload. Thank you. Thank you so much, Waishan, for sharing. All right. Um, next up, we have a question about debate, and um, this person asks if ask how established a debate CCA is in the school and um, what some of the achieve and what some of the achievements of the CCA are. So um, thinking, could you answer this question since you are in ELDDS? Okay, thank you for the question. I think in my response, I will touch on three main points, starting with the general environment of debate and moving on to the performance of debate as a CCA in our school. And finally, to what debate has done to develop me as a student and individual. So firstly, I've been in debate since I chose my CCA last year. And from my experience so far, I think that it's a very enjoyable environment to be in. Because many of the other members in the CCA are extremely supportive of newer members like myself. Right? While we're preparing for debates together, they'll often give me small tips and advice on how to de deliver my speech better, or how to structure it in a more clear manner. And this has really helped me to become a more confident debater and progress in my few months in debate. Secondly, I'll talk about the debate CCA's performance, uh, which is what this question is asking. I'll start by saying that we have extremely dedicated debaters and coaches. Our coaches will often give us additional trainings outside of official CCA timings during the competition periods. 
And this is crucial for helping us to refine our skills even further and take us to the next level as debaters. But in addition to that, we are offered many different opportunities, especially during this COVID period. And we have the chance to take part in international competitions as they are all carried out online. And our students have taken home quite a bit of awards from these competitions. So recently, we had this Triumph Debating Championships. And I think some of our students managed to get the top few speaker positions in that competition as well. So I, if you're asking me, I would say that the debate CCA is rather established in the school. And lastly, I'll talk about the impact debate has had on me as an individual. I think one of the slogans of debate is that in the CCA, we don't learn to debate, but we debate to learn. And I think that's something that, an idea that I really subscribe to. Because for me, debate is not just about becoming a better speaker. But through debate, I've managed to read out more about current affairs and le develop my own opinion and perspective on various issues taking place around the world. And I think this is important, not just in the debate CCA itself, but also for your other academic commitments, right, such as general paper, where you also have to apply the same knowledge and skills. And so overall, I would say that debate in our school is quite a strong CCA. And if you're interested in sharing opinions and learning how to become a better speaker, I will strongly encourage you to come to NJ and join the debate CCA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ting Heng, for your response to that question. Moving on, I see that there are a lot of questions regarding um, the student council. So um, I suppose that many of you are actually interested in the, in the leadership positions that you could possibly take up in NJC. So we actually have a question here about whether or not council is a CCA in NJC or whether or not it is a commitment on top of CCAs. So could we get Joelle to share more about what it is like to be in student council? Okay. Thank you for the question. So just for a bit of context, I have been in council for two years. I'm a JE student and I was actually the vice president of the 52nd Student Council. So firstly, to answer your question, council is a commitment on top of your CCA. It is not counted as a CCA in NJ itself. So if you do take on council, you will have to take on another CCA, be it a sports, club, society or performing arts. Secondly, there was another question about student council, which are if student council is open to all students. So I would like to reassure all of our viewers today here that council is open to all of the students, regardless of whether you are an IP student or a JE student, or whether you have leadership experience prior to this. The, I, the leadership uh, boards in uh, NJC, so meaning student council and other leadership positions such as class committee, is blind to whatever prior leadership background you have, the school really looks for people who are willing to learn, who are willing to serve, and who are willing to go beyond and learn more about themselves, improve themselves while being a leader and serving their community and serving the students around them. So do be assured that even if you're a JE student, you will not be disadvantaged in any way. There are no reserved seats for like IP students or JE students. It's a completely fair selections process, regardless of what leadership position you do decide to take on in uh, National Junior College. Yeah, thank you. Yep, thank you so much, Joelle. All right, in addition to the Student Council, we actually offer a wide variety of other CCA leadership positions, uh, leadership positions in either your CCAs or the class committees and even PSLs. And, um, and, on our, and amongst all, all, all of our panelists today, we actually have a peer support leader, otherwise known as PSLs, and that, and that is Andrea. So Andrea, would you like to share more about what it is like to be a PSL? Definitely, Lei Chao. So, hi, um, I'm a PS, PSL, also known as a peer support leader. So, like the name suggests, we actually take a part in events which are peer oriented, um, involved in taking care of the welfare of the students. And as compared to council, PSL is actually a pretty new initiative. So, there are many more avenues to explore within the PSL realm as compared to council, which is really well established and has really um, a lot of programs for you to get involved in. I would also like to say that um, similar to council, PSL is a commitment which is on top of CCAs too. This means that you will need to take a CCA before you get shortlisted or before you all take the additional commitment of a peer support leader. On top of that, it is also open to all students um, also, so you would not need to be afraid about whether you would get um, the opportunity to become a PSL, um, despite the fact that you um, 
maybe a JE student. Um, but beyond that, um, like Joelle mentioned, once again, as long as you have the core characteristics that we are looking forward to, like the willingness to serve, um, the willingness to take care of each other, the compassion, caring, and kind nature, um, we would be more than willing to accept you into our PSL community. Yes, we'll be pleased to have you there. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Andrew, for sharing. So moving on, um, I actually see this question about orientation. So let me just select it over here. Um, yes, and this person's question is, how many days are there for NJC's at JC1 orientation and what happens on the first day when we enter school? So could we get Chelsea to share more about what it is like to enter NJC on the first day of school? Okay, thank you for your question. So um, for the first part, how many days of orientation will there be? Um, there usually is five to six days of orientation, though this may of course change over the years and change with time. And what happens on the first day when you enter the school is uh, on the very first day is mainly more admin days. So um, you'll be listening to some talks on subject combination, what are the subject combinations that you can choose, for instance, what are the subject prerequisites, so you don't have to worry about having to find all this information because they will be given to you on the first day of school. And we also listen to talks about CCA, how to go about choosing a CCA, when are trials. So on the very first day of school, it will be mainly more admin-based. You will also be able to get to know your orientation group or what we call OG. So there'll be some icebreaker activities for everyone to get to know your new cohort mates. And um, there will also be seniors to help you to facilitate these bond, um, these OG, inter -OG bond, intra OG bonding sessions. So you can rest assured that you'll be able to find out more about what your schooling life in NJ will be like, as well as get to know some people who will form a community for you in, in your two years in JC, because for me, um, the friends that I've had in my OG still st stuck with me throughout my two years in NJ, and um, we still went out even over the, we still went out over the past two years and gave a lot of support to each other. So I think you don't have to worry about the first day of school. I don't think it will be one that's very awkward or very quiet. I think definitely there'll be a lot of activities that are put in place to help you to assimilate into our school environment as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chelsea, for sharing. Next up, um, there, there is a question for over here um, that requests for there's there's a question about um, a, that requests for a JE student to share more about um, what is about why he or she shared why why he or she decided to choose to join NJC, and this is the question. So, why Shan, would you like to take this question? Yeah, sure, Leicha. Thank you. So, uh, the reason why I chose NJC is okay. So. The honest truth is, initially, NJC wasn't one of my top few choices. So it's not necessarily that I chose it because of my strong A-level results. But NJC was one of the, uh, it wasn't one of my top three choices. But when I did join NJC, and if your question is about why join NJ right, as a JE student, I would say that uh, one of the biggest reasons for why I really think that NJ is the right choice for JE students is how inclusive the school is in terms of the environment. Because when it comes to, uh, joining a school or when it comes to join choosing a JC, uh, it really isn't just about how strong your A-level, uh, how strong the A-level results are or just academically, because in the end, it takes your effort as well. So it also matters about school life and how the environment is like in the school. And I think that NJ is extremely inclusive and it's not just the students, it's, me, it's also the teachers. The teachers are very welcoming and they will really take you under their wing and they give you this support system that is really helpful and they encourage you. And even if you're, even if you're a JE student that's new to the school, they will really take you in. And that's really what's so uh, amazing about NJ. And that's what would make me as, an, as a JE student want to join NJ because I know that there will be a support system that's ready to help me. And I know that there'll be a lot of welcoming people. And I know that I will feel very included in, in the environment. And, and talking about this, I think it also brings up the question of uh, whether, uh, why I chose to join a JC over poly, uh, whether it was just academic reasons or whatnot. So uh, for me, my personal reason for why I chose to join 
a JC over poly is because of my personal interest. So with my personal interest, I decided that I wanted to learn more and uh, I wanted to extend my knowledge when it comes to the different subjects that I was taking in my uh, in my secondary school. And I, I realized that I was very interested in the sciences. So I decided that JC would be the right avenue for me to take up uh, as many of these sciences as possible and then learn more and extend my knowledge on those. So that was the reason why I chose to join uh, NJ and a JC. But of course, in in the end, when you're choosing between poly and JC, there is no better choice. There's only a question of what your preference is, how you can cope with each of these. And of course, you would have to do your own research about all the different courses in poly and what is offered in each school in JC, and then make your choice based on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Waichan, for sharing. Next up, could we, I, I, I see this question, um, which, which asks about what it is like, what the, what the typical timetable is like in NJC. Um, so could we get thinking to share more about what this typical timetable is like? Hello, typically on most days, you'll start school at 7.40 a.m. with morning assembly. And normally we will end around 3.30 to 4.30 later for SH1s. For Thursday, we start a bit later at 8.40 a.m. And this period of time before 8.40, most of the time it will be used by sports CCAs to have physical training. So a lot of the time when I come to school earlier on Thursdays, I'll see uh, the trackers running around the field and basketball is playing as well. Uh, normally, next year we'll be having 20 minute lessons. Uh, time starts in 20 minutes. So our lessons will range from one hour to one hour 20 minutes long. In SH, we'll also have quite a few breaks and a few longer ones as well. And those breaks, uh, very good opportunities for us to catch up on our work and also enjoy food in the canteen with our friends. Right. Normally after school, there will be CCA and CCAs normally end around 6.30. So, we'll, so after our CCAs, you wouldn't usually get home too late and we'll still have time to complete our homework as, at home as well. Right. And in addition to CCA, we might also have other academic commitments. So H3 subjects, for example, are also conducted after school. So if you're considering taking a H3 subject in your SH2 year, you might want to take that into account as well. Yeah. Yep, thank you, thank you for sharing. Um, next up, oh, I, I, actually I see a lot of questions coming in. So um, I feel, I, I'm very happy that I, see, that I can see lots of you being so keen on asking so many questions. And um, I, in particular, I see one question about food in NJC. Um, so this person asks, um, what's the best food in the canteen? And oh, maybe you might have gotten, you might have become interested in this because of our NJC publicity, because of our open house publicity videos on our NJC YouTube channel and also our Instagram page. So um, by the way, if you guys haven't looked at our National JC YouTube page and Instagram chat and Instagram page, please go and uh, please do drop by and have a look at what at the content that has been posted up there. All right. All right, so um, yes, food is indeed something that's very interesting in NJC. And perhaps we could get Joanna to share more about what um, food in the canteen is like. So hello, Joanna. Hi. Okay, so what is the best food in the canteen? I don't think I have one specific answer for that. It really just depends on what I feel like eating that day. Because there's such a wide variety in NJ. There's like Yong Tao food, there's Western food, there's Japanese there's economy rice, and there's also Malay and Indian food too. So I think it really just depends on what I feel like eating that day. But some of my personal favourites are definitely the Thai fan. Because, okay, for me, uh, the uncle is really, really friendly. And uh, for a lot of us, he eventually remembers uh, many of us by name. And for me, my Chinese is like not uh, my strong suit. So every time I order from the Thai fan store, he always insists that I uh, learn how to order Chinese. So I learned how to order a lot of dishes. So like cauliflower, I learned it. And then like all the different meats. He insists that, yeah. So after that, um, I think it's quite fun. And a lot of the stall uh, canteen owners are very, very friendly. And even like for other stalls, a lot of them, they also remember your orders. They remember like, oh, uh, today you don't eat mushrooms or maybe you don't eat like specific things. And I think it's just a very welcoming feeling. And the stall canteen vendors are just really, really approachable. So uh, there, I wouldn't say in particular there's one best food, but I think what's really applaudable is that many of our store owners, they really 
try to introduce new things to suit our taste. And I think for one store, what they did was they introduced waffles. So, you know, outside there's like those like Prima Deli waffles and then they put like chocolate spreads or peanut butter. We, we have that now in NJ. And then there are many other stores are introducing new things too. So that's not one best thing, but I think all of them are yep, really Thank great. you so much, Joanna, for sharing about food in NJC. I think our viewers must be getting really hungry, right? Because it's very close to lunchtime. But um, next up, we actually have a question about the class sizes in NJC. Um, this person asked what the class sizes are like, right? So um, could we get Andrea to answer this question, please? Hello, Andrea. Hi. So definitely Lei Chao. So um, our class sizes actually range from around 20 people in a class to 28 people in a class. So I personally have 28 people in my class. Um, so um, if you do the math, it would mean that we have more classes with fewer people in each class. So in our batch, we actually have 21 classes with around 20 to 28 people in each class. So why this small class number or this small class size, right? If you think about it practically, it would mean that we have more individualized attention from all our teachers and we are able to get more feedback in a more comprehensive and effective way as compared to having a very large class size of around maybe like 40. So if we think about in the academics perspective, it's really beneficial because um, more attention from teachers and more effective verbal and um, you know written feedback to each and every one of us. But in terms of um, in a holistic perspective, what about friends? Um, with closer with smaller class sizes, we'll actually be able to you know bond with each other much better because there are fewer people, so there would be um, fewer obstacles for us to actually mingle and make really good friendships that will last us along the way. So um, in my opinion um, and my friend's opinion, we would definitely prefer our class small class sizes because. Um, um, especially with um, the current context of a JC student, right? You would actually have a lot of workload, which would typically mean that you don't have much time to talk to each other, to mingle. So these small class sizes will, will allow you to understand more about each other and forge better and stronger friendships that can last a long way to come, despite the short two years spent in NJ um, because of um, how concise our classes are. Therefore, um, in our opinion, we love it, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Andrew, for sharing. All right, so next up, there's this question about um, what exchange programs there are in NJC. So, um, Chelsea, would you like to take, uh, take this question? Okay, I'll take this question. So, um, for some context, actually, um, I was part of the NJC and Waseda University Senior High School. Um, exchange program where I actually had the opportunity to go to Japan for a research exchange. So what happened was that um, there are, what happened is that in terms of exchange programs, there are many that are available for students, um, especially in terms of research. We have research in both the science and the humanities, which afford students um, overseas exchange programs. But I think one thing to note is that because when we are in junior college, I think as many comments were I've already pointed out two years is actually a very short time and the runway towards A levels is actually um, not very long. So because of that, there is there are less overseas exchange opportunities that are available for JC students. But I think these um, opportunities are definitely present. For one, uh, when I was in JC1, I remember some of my JC1 peers, both IP and JE actually had the opportunity to go to Thailand for a research exchange program. So these exchange programs are definitely present. Um, I've also had seniors who actually um, because they took part in the research programs, the local research programs, be it um, research in school, research out of school, which in collaboration with NUS and NTU, for instance, or even those who took research as a HD subject, because of their excellent performance at the Singapore Science and Engineering Fair, they actually had the opportunity to represent Singapore and go overseas and to go overseas to represent Singapore at the International Science and Engineering Fair. So. I I think all these overseas experiences are definitely um, present and available. For the COVID-19 pandemic persists, of course, then these overseas experiences might not be available for the safety of the students. But in short, the answer is that yes, there are exchange programs and overseas opportunities available. So on this note of overseas 
um, research programs. I can, I've seen a few questions on research, so I'll just touch on it a little lightly. So what students can learn out of research is generally that um, I think it's very hands-on skills, how to carry out research, how to analyze their how to analyze the data and the information that they've obtained in order to draw trends and conclusions. And I think that it's something not just for students who want to pursue science as a career, who want to become researchers, but it's also for students who want to develop their critical thinking skills. And research opportunities in NJ are actually quite abundant. Like what I mentioned earlier, there's the internal research programs. There are also research programs where students are able to collaborate with professors and researchers in institutes of higher learning. And of course, for those who want to pursue research at the highest levels available, there is the H3 research program. So all, I think the learning across all these are pretty similar in the sense that they learn how to carry when you take HD research, the stakes are a lot higher in the sense that it is our students who have taken research programs in NJ have reflected that they have learned a lot, even though it is definitely time consuming having to do experiments in the lab, having to churn out their reports and their posters for presentation, I think many of them find that it's a very rewarding experience. So I personally, I was and I think that it really sparked my interest in science and which is also what drove me to pursue H3 chemistry at the A-levels. So I think that it's really something that will allow you to learn more about your, learn more about science as a subject and also learn more about yourself as an individual and where your inclinations are. So I would definitely recommend these exchange programs, overseas experiences, as well as the NJC research program to students who are interested. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea, for sharing. Indeed, research is a very interesting um, program that NJC does offer and is a very enriching one too. So do consider taking it up if you choose to join NJC. So next up, I see a question right here that asks about um, whether or not there are any forms of support that one can get within the school, such as a counsellor. So perhaps Waishan can share about what about what the support system is like in NJC. So hello, Waishan. Hi, Le Chao. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So when it comes to support, I think there's two levels of support. There's support for stress. So when you're feeling bummed out or when you're feeling stressed, there should be a support system for you to help you deal with that if you need it. And there will also, of course, be academic support. So I will, uh, I will start with support for stress. So in terms of NJ, there's two types of support for stress. There's people who are around you that will try to help you out and there are people you can approach. So when it comes to people around you, of course, you have your friends and the welcoming environment in NJ that I described previously. But you also have uh, like what Andrea talked about, the peer support leaders who are there to support their peers and to ensure that they're not too stressed out and to watch out for their peers. So PSLs are there and they're able to make sure that you have someone to talk to in the case that you need to or someone to, uh, you know, tell talk to about your stress and stuff like that. But there are, of course, also your PM teachers and your subject teachers. And in my experience, I know that uh, PM, my PM and subject teachers are extremely caring and they'll constantly check up on you uh, in various ways. Like they'll ask you how you're doing, they'll ask you about your day, they'll ask you various questions about how your health is. And they're always open to be a listening ear. They're always open to listening to you uh, talk about stress or talk about anything. And uh, that's just a really supportive system that you can rely on. And it's not necessarily that you always have to approach them. Sometimes they'll even approach you on their own accord to see that maybe you're a little, you look a little more stressed. And I think that's a really helpful system because these are the people that are closest to you, right? These are the people that are around you. But in the case that you're looking for someone that you can approach, of course, there will also be year heads and support uh, there are other teachers that can support you. There's a lot of support systems. Uh, for example, uh, our year heads are very, very welcoming to uh, students that are willing to talk to them about stress and about their problems. And they'll really like, you know, be like a friend to you and they'll really help you and they'll talk to you and they're, they're just really uh, welcoming and really nice. And we also have counselors. Uh, as you described, the school does have a counselor and uh, you can uh, book appointments with the counselors and you can talk to them as well. Uh, there are also, you know, uh, the one thing that I really love about NJ is that uh, as long as there are teachers that you're comfortable with, most of them will be willing to listen to you. Like even if they're not teaching you or even if they're not in your, in your class, right? If you know them and you're comfortable with them and you go up to them, they will be willing to listen. And that's just how supportive the system is. And that's really what I love about NJ. And when it comes to academics, uh, so now uh, moving on to academic support. 
academic support in itself in NJ is also uh, really well done because uh, again, you have these caring teachers and uh, with these teachers, they'll check up on your academic progress and, and they, they won't just push you to excel. They're not going to uh, stress you out, but instead they will, tr they will really try to understand you and your problems at hand and they'll be really, uh, they'll be really understanding and they'll and they'll really try their best to help you so i think in terms of academic support there's nothing much to worry about and we also of course have an ecg counselor that you can go to about your academic worries whether it's uh, about something in school or whether it's about your future uh, after ng and these are the different these are the various support systems that are available in ng thank you thank you washan for sharing even for me personally i think that what 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 really stands out about NJC is the very warm environment that we have here. And I'm very thankful for all of my friends, the teachers, all of the support staff in NJC. So do consider coming to NJC because of a warm environment. All right. So um, speaking about the the whole this whole NJ experience, I think the facilities also do play a very huge part in um, one school journey. So um, we have this question by by this question and. Um, the question is, I hear that the facilities in NJC are a bit dated or limited. Has there or is there any plans to upgrade or improve the facilities? If yes, by when? So perhaps Joelle could take this question. Yes, hi, thank you for the question. Okay, so firstly to give a general overview, um, definitely our facilities and everything are not state of the art because the school has been built for more than 30 years ago. However, they are able to support our learning without causing us any disruption and they're always undergoing um, improvements and they're always open to the students' feedback so that they can make the facilities better for us and to help us better support our learning. For example, we do have a false report form that is um, around the school that students can scan a QR code and they will be brought to a false report form where they can let the school management know of any faults that are around the school, for example, broken lecture theatre tables or they find that their class is stuffy and they require an additional fan. That is possible and the school does reply pretty quickly to all of these um, requirements to the students because the school does definitely prioritise our comfort when we are learning. Um, Additionally, the school has also just been upgrading the facilities in school. For example, just last year in 2020, the lecture theatre tables and chairs were upgraded. All the lecture theatre tables have been fixed so that they're all functional for our students to use. As well as the tables in our classrooms so that students have a smooth surface to work on. Additionally, some of the classrooms used to not have windows and students did uh, mention that it was a bit stuffy. So last year and in 2019 as well, there were renovation works that helped to add windows to the classroom so that it makes the classroom more well ventilated so that students can learn in a more comfortable environment. Um, moving on to some of the facilities that we have to help support the students' learning. We have five different lecture theatres that are all um, constantly, as I've said just now, being upgraded and are very, very comfortable for our students to learn in. We also have science labs for all three of our sciences, for biochemistry and physics, and they are all well equipped with science equipment, with um, chemicals that are required, and of course, our science lab technicians who are there to help support our learning as well. So just to add on, on um, the facilities that are being provided for our students who are interested in the science stream, um, the research program in NJ is very niche, and it's, if not, it's, it is probably one of the best. <laughs> so yes, because NJ does invest pretty heavily into the research program. So some examples include state-of-the-art technology, such as our nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy machine in NJ's own Sigma lab, and the Agritech facility, which is a platform for students to do their own research in the field of agriculture. It is a new facility that is, that is um, near our boarding school area, yes. Yes, very interesting. I've been there before. I actually went there to um, uh, harvest plants for my Interact CC. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And um, it also gives our NG students an edge in the future world because these skills talks um, allow us to, you know, feed our inquisitive minds, research skills that are definitely important in the future world where science and technology are rapidly advancing every moment. Yes, and for our music and art students, of course, we do have multiple soundproof music studios to facilitate extra music lessons, music CCAs, such as our piano ensemble, our symphonic band, Chinese orchestra, and Guzheng that was mentioned just now as well. And also a classroom block that is dedicated to our art students so that they have a comfortable space to work on their coursework and projects. And of course, sports-wise, we are definitely not lacking as well. We have a large um, football field and as well as a 400 meter track that facilitates our PE lessons, as well as track and field, football, and these facilities, of course now because of COVID, um, it 
we are um, regulating the students who are able to use this at their free time. But these facilities are open to to the students at any time of the day so that they are able to go down and play sports with their friends, which definitely helps as a very big stress relief. And we also have two indoor sports halls, so PE lessons can proceed even during rainy seasons. And it also allows our CCAs like floorball, basketball to have their own training after school. And also, a lot of my friends do actually like to go down and get to play basketball. It is a very familiar sight to see all of like the basketballers or even people who don't play basketball just in the basketball having fun. And yeah, it definitely helps to make um, uh, the school life a lot livelier. So yes, overall, I would say that the facilities in NJC are definitely good enough to support your learning. And the school is very open to helping you to improve your learning and to ensure your comfort when you're studying. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Joel, for sharing more about what NJ has got to offer in terms of our facilities. All right, so I should see this question about art right here. Um, the question is, can more details about H2 art be provided? And um, yes, of course, we can provide you with more details about H2 art. So jo Joanna, would you like to answer this question? So to provide more details about H2 art. Yep. Hi, Joanna. Hi. Okay, so for us, uh, so NJC is one of the three a uh, JCs that are AP Centre. So for NJC, every student who takes H2 Art has to take H3 Art. So how H2 Art works is that uh, to get into art, you need to pass a selections test, which I think I mentioned previously that will be held on the 1st of February from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. And in addition, there will also be an interview for the art to be selected into the art program. Uh, additionally, for art, uh, so for H2 art, it consists of about two papers. So 60% of your how you're graded will be by your coursework, which is um, you have to go through various drafts throughout the year, and uh, they'll be provided with teacher supervision. And about in about October, which is the month before your A-level month, you'll be provided, uh, you have to submit your coursework. And then in addition, for the other 40% will be a written paper. So it's maybe talking about uh, artworks, uh, describing about the techniques and also how uh, the artists and the motivations behind the work. In addition, for H3 Art, it will be a two-hour written paper. So for these, uh, for more information about how the syllabus works, you can always check them out on SEAB syllabus website. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you so much, Joanna, for answering that question. Um, so the next question that um, I would like to feature over here is this question by Carol Yap. So Carol Yap's question is, if I am not good in English, would I suffer in GP? And um, perhaps this might be a question that many of you are might have in your minds because um, GP is a subject that many of us actually take um, because if we do not take this subject called knowledge and inquiry, uh, we will have to take the general paper subject. So but it's Ting Hing would like to offer his views um, regarding Carol Yap's question. So hello, Ting Hing. Okay, sure. So I think I'll begin by talking about the nature of GP as a subject. So GP stands for general paper, and it focuses on testing students' awareness of general knowledge and whether they're able to form critical opinions about things that are going on in the world. Right? Therefore, the, the, the command of English is not emphasized as heavily in GP as it is in O levels, because you are merely building on the foundations that you should already have Right, in being able to express yourself well. In GP, we, have, we are tested through two papers. We have an essay paper and a comprehension paper. Right, in both papers, language marks are awarded based on how you express your ideas. So yes, the command of language is rather important for GP. Right. So if you want a small tip on how to uh, prepare yourself for GP when you come to NJ, it's really just to read more. Right? Because even if you're... Uh, we're still reading about subjects that you are passionate in. You automatically take note of the sentence structures used by the author and how the author expresses his own ideas. And reading has really helped me to elevate my linguistic ability since secondary school years. Yeah, and I think an interesting word choice I picked up in your question is the word suffer. But I think that implies that you're asking whether you'll be thrown into the deep end if you are not very strong in expressing yourself. And I think that that's definitely not the case because of the support structures we have in our school. I, I think that a lot of our English department is really very caring. So for example, 
during the circuit breaker period, my general paper teacher actually conducted group consultations with our class. She got a few of us to form groups of five or six and uh, speak with her over Zoom about any problems that we might have in the subject. And this really helped me to get more personalized attention to help to develop my skills in GP. Not only that, uh, an incident I remember very vividly is that right before the promotional exams period, there was this passage about play that I was quite confused about. I really didn't know what the author's point was. And after I realized that a few classmates shared my similar confusion, I met my general paper teacher for consultation. And she sat down with us and actually took us through the passage paragraph by paragraph, helping us to understand it better so that we will be able to answer the questions. So the answer is no, even if your English command is not that good, you will not suffer in GP because there are teachers there to support you. And their GP is not unstudyable, right? as many people think. Right? There are ways that you can really improve your ability to do well in the subject. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jen King, for sharing. So um, we actually only have about 10 minutes left um, for our live, for our student panel live Q&A session. So we'll take a few more questions, all right? So um, I see this question from Godsan, Godsan and um, his question, and, and Godsan's question is, um, as for the humanities, is geography a subject which is difficult to score? So uh, many of you might actually have this question in mind because um, most of you will be thinking about, should, 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 should you decide to take a combine a science stream combination you would be you would have to decide on what your contrasting subject is and many of you will be deciding between economics and some other subjects such as geography so could we get chelsea to talk about what it is like to take h2 geography and followed by andrea who will talk about what it is like to take h2 economics so chelsea please okay thank you for your question so, so as usual to go back some context i did take h2 chemistry h2 geography as part of as my contrasting subject because i took the science stream so i think to answer your question directly geography is a subject that is that is definitely difficult to score in at the start because at the start all of us are just trying to grapple with the new content that we are learning, the new skill, our end very good. But I think it is something that, that can definitely be improved on because I remember when I first got back my first um my first time assessment in geography. I, I remember uh if I don't remember wrongly, I think I failed pretty badly, but um my results improved over the two years and I managed this year. And I think, um, in fact, the geography department actually insists on holding us to A-level rubrics right from the start so that we are constantly working towards a goal that we have to meet at the end of our two years, which is why I think that failing at the start is not something that is, very, it's, it's not something to be very um, caught up over or it's not something that should be very demoralizing. So over the two years, I think what helped me to improve was definitely my passion in the subject because learning about the global economy, learning about, for instance, um, why Dyson decided to move to Singapore, for instance, were things that I was really very, very interested in. And this interest actually fueled my, um, gave me the motivation to continue to improve my geography in terms of my thinking skills, in terms of how well I was able to understand phenomena around me, for instance. So I think definitely passion is one thing that will definitely help you to score. And I think that, um, like what many of the previous panelists have already mentioned, the very, very supportive culture in NJ, where everyone is willing to help each other out, is really something that helped me to improve my geography as well, because we actually formed study groups and we made notes together. We compared essays and try to help each other improve. And the teachers are also very, very supportive in the sense that they were willing to stay with us for consults in school, even until late at night. So I think that this passion, as well as the very, very strong support that I had from my geography classmates, as well as my geography teachers, really helped me to improve. So yes, geography is a subject that is difficult to score right at the start, but it's not something that is impossible to do well in at the A-levels, as long as you're willing to put in the effort. So, yep, these are my thoughts on geography. Yeah, thank you so much, Chelsea, for sharing about what it is like to take H2 geography. 
So right now, could we, could we have Andrea to share more about, to, talk, to share with us about what it is like to take H2 economics? Hello, Andrea. Definitely, Lee Chow. So um, when we talk about H2 economics, um, it would also have its fair share of difficulties. Um, for example, um, firstly and foremost, it is a new subject, which means that um, I, I clearly recall the first lesson of economics when we were um, introduced to like demand and supply and all of us were completely in awe just staring at the PowerPoint slides just thinking to ourselves how will we be able to like get good grades in this um, in this like subject but um, <laughs> needless to say we will all make it at the end and uh, with all our caring teachers and support of mentors, we will be able to reach the finish line um, intact and in whole. <laughs> um, but um, on the other side, um, on the other hand rather, everyone would be on the same level because it's a completely new subject. So I think there's um, a slightly um, slight advantage if you think in a different perspective. But uh, regardless, of, uh, regardless of that um, small advantage, um, all in all, the skills are new, such as evaluating, applying um, what we learn to the real world, and understanding things um, from a critical thinking point of view. If I were to summarize the entire um, economics curriculum, um, it would be consisting of two main parts, microeconomics as well as macroeconomics. So microeconomics would be uh, focusing on supply and demand, as well as other factors which affect um, price levels and macroeconomics would be understanding of the economy as a whole. Um, so macroeconomics would be a bottom up approach and macroeconomics would be a top down approach. And you will be taught microeconomics in J1 and macroeconomics in J2. And when it comes to uh, the exam format, uh, it would be um, consisting of two papers, a case study paper as well as an essay paper. Um, and you would be able to um, apply both micro and macroeconomics to um, either one of the papers. Yeah, I hope that gives you a brief outline of how um, economics looks like in JC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew, for sharing. So on this topic of economics, um, we do have a question about the difference in the difficulty levels level of H1 economics in comparison to H2 economics. So could we get Joel to answer this question since Joel actually took H1 economics at the H1 level. Hello, Joel. Okay, hello. Thank you for the question. So firstly, I'll just go through the differences between H1 and H2 economics. So for H1 economics, it's definitely a lot less content heavy than H2 economics because H1 economics, um, there are some subjects that you will not be taught. For example, uh, and decisions, market structure, some of the topics, some of the content, will, you will not be required to know, it will not be examined, as well as um, the method of assessment. So for H1 Econs, you will sit for one three-hour case study paper, whereas for H2 Econs, you will be sitting for a case study paper as well as a um, essay paper. So you will, they will give you an essay question about economics and then you will reply it completely based on the content that you have learned during lectures, during tutorials, etc. Yes, so that is um, the differences between H1 and H2 economics. I would say for difficulty level wise, I think it's important that you look through um, your skill set that you already have in secondary school. So for example, for me, how I gauged if I should take H1 or H2 economics was that um, for social studies, your combined humanities social studies, I realized that my case study skills were much stronger than my essay skills because for me, essay skills, I think it was just a matter of like whether or not you study enough for the topic um, well enough, how much you know it. It's a bit risky in a sense. I think personally for me, that's why I decided to do HR economics because it is um, more case study based, which is my strength, which is why I decided to play to that. Yeah, but if you feel that um, you're able to do both equally well, then for sure, go ahead, take history economics. But of course, do take into consideration the content that is required. Do take into consideration the other subjects that you're taking and whether or not you will be able to have the time to manage H2 economics alongside the rest of your commitments. Yeah. Thank you, Joel, for sharing. All right, so to end off, um, I would like to, I would like Waishan to answer this question. Um, by Carol Yap and Carol Yap's question is, what are the challenges you face during the transition from O levels to JC1? Because um, this is actually some a question that many of you JE students will have in mind. So yeah, hello, Washan, you can answer this last question. Thank you, Leicha. Yeah, so there are 
definitely challenges that you face when you transition from O level to JC. So uh, for me, there were two main challenges. So I'll split up this answer into two uh, answers. One is, of course, a shift in your environment. And the second one is a shift in the uh, academics. So I'll start with the shift in the environment. So in the shift in the environment from O levels to uh, JC, the main issue that, uh, the main problem that I faced was that I had to leave uh, my school of four years. And what's uh, really, uh, challenging about that is because I already uh, ingrained that secondary school to be part of my identity. So uh, that secondary school was a part of who I am and the friends that I made were bonds that were built very strongly. So these are people that I saw every day and these are people that I could hang out during recess and I, I knew who I could hang out with in the school. But now transitioning onto JC, suddenly everything's new. I don't know everyone anymore and it's uh it's a whole new environment it's strangers i haven't met acquaintances that i'm about to make and uh despite that uh what really helped in terms of ng with these challenges is that uh, again it's a welcoming environment that i described uh which relates to ng and really uh I was so welcomed into NJ uh, by a lot of the people uh, in my cohort that I, I felt like it was a very welcoming environment. But of course, it's not the case for everyone, right? So some of my friends who joined NJ were not able to find friends as quickly as I could. But there were there's NJ has a lot of like group activities, uh, like okay, during orientation you're grouped with your houses, or you know you you, you have to go for your CCA events, you have to go for. Uh, you know, your class events. And with these different events and such, you'll be grouped into different groups and you'll have to work with different people. And you, you definitely form an identity with them. And that really helps you to build this, uh, this uh, group of people that you could call your friends as well. This group of people that you did a CCA with or this group of people that are your CCA mates, your classmates, and that helps you form friends. And because of that system that's in NJ and because of how welcoming everyone is, you know, when you join NJ, you really become a part of the NJ family and you feel like you're not excluded. You're not just like someone random. And I think that's really good. So um, yeah, there are definitely challenges in integration, but it's not something that can't be overcome. And you definitely just need to know where to look. And then, uh, moving on to academics, right? It is definitely scary, and it is definitely challenging when you first like join JC and you you see all these uh, subjects and how much deeper the content goes because uh, the level of uh, knowledge that's required for all these contents, uh, all this new content is actually a lot higher. Like for example, mathematics vectors is no longer two dimensional, but rather three dimensional. And despite that, um, it's definitely culpable. Like you can do it. It's hard. It's definitely not super easy, but it's possible and it takes effort. And well, the good thing about NJ again is that there's a support system when it comes to academics from various teachers, from your counselors and from anyone that you're willing to talk to. And that's what will help you overcome these challenges when you come to JC. Thank you, Lee Chow. Thank you so much, Roshan, for answering that question. And with that, we have come to the end of our student panel live Q&A session for NJC eOpen House 2021. So due to time constraints, we won't be able to, to answer all of your questions. However, do stay tuned for the next Q&A session on 12th January, which will continue to be streamed on our Facebook page and YouTube page, um, where you'll be able to hear from even more panelists who will be sharing about their NJ experiences. So we thank you for joining us today. Um, for those of you who have joined since um, 10 a.m., thank you for staying on with us for the past two and a half hours. And um, we actually we wish you all we wish you all the best for the collection of your O level results on 11th January. So, should you have any further queries about um, about what life in NJ is like, or about the possible subject combinations that we offer, CCAs that we offer, you can head to our website and nationaljc.moe.edu.sg to, to source for more of such information, or alternatively, visit our Instagram page, National JC, or our YouTube channel to watch the videos that have been produced by our open house committee, that have been specially prepared by our open house committee um, to get to know more about what life really is like in NJC. All right, so with that, we have come to the end of this Q&A session, and we thank you for your time. Thank you so much, and have a good, afternoon and the rest and remainder of the weekend. Bye-bye.